August 2020, and this is Core Talk, the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers official podcast. I'm Andy, your host, and as I was writing the script for this month's episode, I started writing something like, as always, we bring you the people, projects, and programs of the Norfolk District. Then I looked down at what I wrote, and I, I read it a couple of times over, and I realized that there is no such thing right now as, as always. We're not at that point. It feels like we're still all waiting to see what's going to happen next. It's like we're all staying alert and aware of the peoples, the customs, the courtesies, and all these life changes, and acknowledging our, our past and our part in that as we try to figure out our future. So in taking that theme, we're bringing you a two-chapter special on the history of Fort Norfolk. And for those of you that don't know, Fort Norfolk is the home of the Norfolk District. That segment was created by Patrick Bloodgood, who had his start with us here at Core Talk in the Norfolk District and has since moved on to Headquarters Public Affairs. So we're looking forward to hearing and seeing the products that he puts forth in his new position. Also, it is National Hispanic American Heritage Month. That extends from now until October 15th. We do have some information about that, a link that you can use. I recommend checking that out after the program today. And we will be bringing you the Great Places to Work segment, as well as news from around the district. All right, let's get started with Chapter 1 of our special, The History of Fort Norfolk. So I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome Stephen Forrest, the Fort Norfolk historian for the Norfolk Historical Society, to the podcast, Core Talk. Welcome. Thank you. So first off, I want to, how long have you been involved with Fort Norfolk? Well, when my kids were little in the uh, mid-1990s, I brought them to see the fort one day when the Norfolk Historical Society had it open. I must have seemed really interested in the fort because they asked me if I wanted to be a docent that very day. And I've been involved with the fort ever since. So it's been over 25 years now. So 25 years with the fort. And there's still a lot of people, even our our little surrounding area up here in, in Norfolk, that don't even know that it exists. What is its importance in the kind of the the fabric of our our history here in Norfolk and for the nation? Well, Fort Norfolk is one of the uh, first forts built by the United States government after we became a country. And we needed the forts because of the wars in Europe, because France and England had gone to war after the French, French Revolution, and suddenly we had armed warships floating in and out of Norfolk, and George Washington wanted to stay neutral. And everyone around here was complaining, how are we supposed to remain neutral? We don't even have a fort to defend the harbor. We don't have an army to defend the armor. We don't even have artillery to defend the harbor. So this complaint was voiced all up and down the East Coast, and Congress finally listened, and they appropriated money for a fort. After that, the fort was used to stop ships coming in and out of the harbor that may have diseases on them, such as yellow fever, because that was a big concern in the early years of Norfolk that uh, the ships coming in and out of the Caribbean would be infected with this disease. So the guns at Fort Norfolk would ensure that the ships stopped to be inspected. Then when the War of 1812 came along, uh, Fort Norfolk became a major part of the defensive system during that war and actually participated in a slight way during the Battle of Craney Island in 1813 that saved uh, Norfolk and Portsmouth from the British invasion in that war. Then it goes on to the Civil War, and you've got Fort Norfolk defending uh, Norfolk Harbor from the Union Navy, Then once 
the Confederates evacuate Norfolk, then the Union Army has a brand new use for the fort. First, as a place for uh, what we call contraband of war or runaway slaves that are seeking freedom before the Emancipation Proclamation. They did this first at Fort Monroe, and later they started coming to Fort Norfolk. The Union Army wasn't completely satisfied with this use of the fort, and they turned it into a prisoner of war camp during the Civil War. The fort was also used as a naval weapons depot from the 1850s until the late 1870s. And now the Army Corps of Engineers is here. So Fort Norfolk has an incredible history, but people just don't know because it sits alone on the waterfront away from major highways. And some of those aspects, uh, especially like during the Civil War, I mean, I know that there was, um, it was also housing ammunition at the time uh, of that, that period. So there was some discussion, I believe, that it may have actually played a part in arming the CSS Virginia. This is correct. It, when the state of Virginia seceded from the Union, uh, just two days later, the Confederate militia came over the walls of Fort Norfolk and captured the fort. There wasn't very many people here. There was basically a keeper of the magazine and maybe a few guards, but nothing substantial. They easily captured the fort, and it was full of gunpowder and shells and empty shells because the fort was here at that time as a weapons depot to supply the United States Navy for the middle of the East Coast. So that was a lot of gunpowder. And so on its way out to go meet the, uh, the monitor. Right. Well, once they constructed the Virginia, they stopped at the fort to get some of this powder and munitions. Now, a lot of the powder had been distributed around the uh, Confederacy, and it wasn't all here at that point. But they used the shells and the powder from the fort to arm the Virginia. Not only did they arm the Virginia, the Virginia was short uh, 30 gunners that they needed to man the Virginia. So they took men stationed out of Fort Norfolk who were in the uh, Confederate Army and placed them on the Virginia to fight in the Battle of the Ironclads. So Fort Norfolk provided men and munitions for the battle. So we played a significant role in that battle. And then after that, when the, the Union Army took it back over and turned it into the prisoner of war camp, there's some interesting um, writings, I believe, up in one of the buildings from those folks. Right. We have uh, graffiti from blockade runners that were left at the fort. They say quite a number of things, but one of the more interesting things is they leave us a menu of what they had to eat while they were imprisoned here. And they got a lot of pork and beans and uh, a special treat on Sunday, some kind of rotten meat. But uh, it wasn't a pleasant place to be as a prisoner of war camp. They uh, turned the fort into a prisoner of war camp at the end of 1862, and it remained a prison camp until May of 1866 when they let the last prisoner go. So not only did they have army prisoners at the fort, they also had political prisoners in the fort. In other words, if they didn't like you in Norfolk, they would throw you in Fort Norfolk. If uh, they suspected you of anything, they'd throw you in Fort Norfolk. They would also take Union soldiers that committed crimes and throw them in Fort Norfolk. So you had these three groups of people all together in Fort Norfolk. And it grew to over 400 prisoners at one point. And even the Army's surgeon uh, said that this place is overcrowded and unsanitary. But that didn't stop them from adding more people. And we also had a very unique uh, set of prisoners at Fort Norfolk because the Union Army was gathering officers they captured from all over the South, and they were sending them to Fort Norfolk. And the Confederate Army was gathering all the Union officers they captured, and they were sending them to City Point near Richmond. And they would, from time to time, exchange prisoners. You could get a lieutenant for a lieutenant, a captain for a captain, 
and even a colonel for a colonel if he captured in enough of them. So there were quite a few prisoners exchanged up and down the James River during the war straight from Fort Norfolk. And one of these officers, when he was back in Richmond, he complained because he was put in a 15 by 15 foot cell in the fort with 12 other officers and only a small slit in the wall for light. So it was not pleasant conditions. And they said it really stank in the fort. (laughs) So not a place to be. Well, I can imagine, because if you walk around the fort now, it's hard to imagine that you could actually put 400 prisoners plus a security detail in the compound that is currently Fort Norfolk. Well, they wouldn't have put the security detail inside the fort. They would have basically been on the fort wall, and they were stationed outside the fort. Now, there is a funny story that the Navy and the Army throughout the war had a back-and-forth disagreement on who should have the fort because before the war it belonged to the Navy, yet the Army captured it, and the Army was using it, but the Navy wanted to get it back to use as a weapons depot again. So there was all this negotiating going back and forth. And a Navy uh, officer moved into the, the keeper's house at the fort, and an Army officer came and threw him out. And that, uh, because he said he outranked him, and he was in charge of the fort, so the Navy officer had to go. So that caused all kinds of trouble. <laughs> but, uh, so it was never a dull moment here at the fort. We even had some escapes from the fort. Uh, there was one case where a couple of men poked a hole in the top of one of the buildings and climbed out in the middle of the night. Another man simply ran to the wall, jumped off, and into the river and swam to Portsmouth. And he didn't get shot as he was swimming away. So... This place was not escape-proof, but uh, nobody wanted to be here. But there was another really interesting point about the Civil War era for the fort was that the 1st Regiment of U.S. Colored Troops was actually stationed here at the fort. It was a short amount of time, just about two weeks, where they were the unit in charge of guarding all the prisoners at the fort. In fact, one of the... uh, Union prisoners who had been thrown into the fort got into big trouble because he insulted the sergeant from the 1st Regiment of Colored Troops because he said the sergeant was being too friendly with a white woman who'd come to visit a prisoner at the fort. And then the uh, Union prisoner had to be disciplined for his behavior. (laughs) So there was all kinds of things going on here. And then I know that uh, once the... the after the Civil War, um, there was a portion of period where there was no activity here, but you had an in- interesting resident take up uh, Act- caretaker status. The cater- caretaker status was Lemuel Fentress, and he actually was here uh, between the 1820s when the Army decided to give up the fort and when the Navy moved in, when they found him and they threw him out. And he was not happy about being thrown out. So he actually submitted a bill for the Army to pay him for maintaining the fort, which they didn't pay him because they didn't invite him to stay. (laughs) He wasn't supposed to be here. But Fort Norfolk uh, was basically abandoned by the Army in 1824 when they moved all the men stationed here to Fortress Monroe because Fort Monroe had been completed. It had better artillery. The guns were newer. They had more range. And they could protect Hampton Roads from a more strategic position than Fort Norfolk. And the fort really fell into disrepair during that time period. Uh, And one thing that most people don't realize is that Fort Norfolk almost became the Naval Academy. Really? Yes. what happened is they were studying the idea of where to put a naval academy. And there was actually a bill submitted in the United States Senate to make Fort Norfolk the naval academy. Uh, It never passed through Congress uh, because the War Department did not want to give up the fort. 
Even though they didn't man the fort, they said, in case we ever have another war, we want to have a second defense line, and we may need the fort. And to make it the Naval Academy, the plan submitted by the Navy would require tearing down all the walls of the fort. It would no longer be useful as a fort. So that was in 1854, I believe. And the very next year, the Secretary of the Navy, without congressional funding, started the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, at another War of 1812 fort that uh, he was able to get from the War Department. And that's why the Naval Academy is not in Norfolk. It's in Annapolis, because it was done without congressional approval. So that's the end of Chapter 1 of our special segment, The History of Fort Norfolk. We're going to move on now to our Great Places to Work segment. Just remember, the links, URLs, and pertinent information is all going to be found in our show notes, so make sure you head down to that after the show. So at the time of this recording, we're hiring for an engineering technician. Now in this position, You'll be utilizing CAD systems to construct 3D models to properly develop drawings for architectural and engineering features. This job closes out on September 29th. We're also hiring a civil engineer. This is a GS-13 geotechnical position. In this job, you'll serve as a consultant on complex geotechnical problems to other organizational elements within the district and to outside agencies. Now, this job can be found on USA Jobs, but applicants must submit resumes and application packages to an email that you'll find in that job advertisement. So it's a little bit different than ones you might have applied to before, but all the details are going to be found in the link for that job below. That job also closes out September 30th. Now we're going to move on to news from around the district and we'll cover some of the news items that you might have missed since last episode. All these stories and more can be found in the news section on our website. August 26th, CORE completes Arlington National Cemetery admin building renovations. The iconic administration building at Arlington National Cemetery reopened earlier this month with a socially distanced ribbon cutting ceremony after a nearly two year, $13.8 million overhaul. August 27th, North Landing Bridge replacement project clears a major hurdle. A U.S. Army Corps of Engineers project aimed at replacing North Landing Bridge took a crucial step forward when Lieutenant General Todd Semonite signed a chief's report recommending the North Landing Bridge Replacement Studies findings for authorization by Congress. And that's all we have for our news from around the district. Let's head back to Chapter 2 of our special, The History of Fort Norfolk. There was an incident uh, just off the coast in the work up to the War of 1812, where you had um, the uh, British were grabbing sailors. Well, that was impressment of sailors. And the reason it was going on was that in the uh, war between France and the rest of Europe that became the Napoleonic Wars, the only thing that kept Great Britain safe from Napoleon was the English Channel and the British Navy. So they had to man every ship they could. Well, in America, you have ships with American sailors on them. They know how to sail. They speak English. So they're like the perfect candidate for the British Navy. And the Navy was taking them off American merchant ships and simply saying to them, well, you look like a British citizen to me, so you're in the British Navy now. 
because we need you to defend the country. And this was really interfering with uh, the commerce of the United States. We were losing money because before impressment really started picking up, we were making a lot of money in this country because we were selling goods to Britain and France, selling them to both sides because we were neutral. And in fact, if you want to learn the causes of the War of 1812, there was a document that was actually written up by the merchants in Norfolk complaining about impressment and what was going on. And it reads like the causes of the War of 1812, and it was submitted to Congress. Well, with all this going on back and forth and tensions rising with Great Britain, uh, warships were still visiting the Hampton Roads area from both sides. Well, the British Navy would have people jump ship and swim to shore, and or they would steal a ship boat and row it to shore. And so impressed sailors were constantly trying to escape from the British Navy when they were in sight of an American port. So four men actually did escape, and in 1807, we were preparing one of our frigates to go on a cruise to protect our commerce, and it was the Chesapeake, which happened to be built right over at the Norfolk Naval Shipyard across the water from Fort Norfolk. And unlike today, when they were going out for a cruise, that was when they would raise their crew for the ship. And you would enlist for the cruise. And when you got back, they'd release you because we didn't want a big standing Navy and have to pay all these sailors. Well, four men that enlisted before the cruise had jump ship from a naval uh, vessel in the British Navy. They were American citizens, so it wasn't any problem for them to be signed up as sailors on the American ship. Well, the British Navy got wind of what was going on, so they, they stopped the Chesapeake just as it was leaving the Chesapeake Bay. And it was stopped by a ship called the HMS Leopard. And they sent an officer on board to request to search the American vessel for British sailors. And Commodore Barron, who was in charge of the ship at the time, said, this is ridiculous. I mean, you don't search an American warship. All Everyone on board is an American sailor. And politely told them to go away. The British didn't like this answer, so when the sailor and the officer returned to their ship, they simply raised their gun ports, rolled out the cannons, and opened fire on the Chesapeake. Chesapeake was not ready for combat. The gun deck was strewn with material that hadn't been put away. They were only able to get one cannon ready to fire one shot back at the British before Commodore Barron realized he couldn't win this battle, and he struck the colors and surrendered. The British came on board, seized these four sailors, took them back on their ships, and sailed away. And when the Chesapeake sailed back into Norfolk Harbor, everybody thought, well, this means war. So they called up the Virginia militia and they started manning Fort Norfolk. And Fort Norfolk at that time didn't look like Fort Norfolk today. It had actually been decommissioned as a fort about 1802. And they were relying only on Fort Nelson across the river. So the Virginia militia came in and started repairing the fort and getting ready for war because to attack an American warship it's an act of war. Of course, Thomas Jefferson was concerned. He sent negotiators down here. And one of Norfolk's uh, prominent lawyers, he was sent on board the British ships to negotiate. And this was Robert Taylor, who was actually a mayor of Norfolk several times. And through these negotiations, they averted war, but everybody thought we were going to war. That's why Congress appropriated more money for better fortifications along the East Coast. And as a result of this, uh, they funded the construction of Fort Norfolk as you see it today with the masonry walls and many of the buildings within the fort. How did the fort look before the, the masonry walls and stuff? What was, what was its construction? Before the masonry construction... In 1794, you have to remember, this country was brand new. We didn't have a lot of money, and we had a lot of debt. 
that we owed France after the war. So when we went to build a series of forts, they were making them on the cheap. So they built these forts out of dirt, wood, and a very limited amount of masonry. So we have drawings of Fort Nelson that were put together in 1799 that show what Fort Nelson looked like. And we know that Fort Norfolk was built by the same engineer who used similar plans on both forts. And we have a survey that was done in 1795 when the government finally purchased the fort. They actually started building it before they purchased the land, which is rather strange. But that's the way it happened back then. And this survey shows the top of the fort, what the line looked like. And the survey showed that the fort looked like a straight line with a hook on the end and a barracks behind it. The fort actually had five guns that faced straight down the river and two guns that angled off to the side. And they were aiming at points in Portsmouth. And the reason they were guarding these two points is that is where the British landed during the American Revolution when they captured Fort Nelson in 1779. So we have the descriptions of the engineer of the fort. The fort would have earth walls with breaks in the wall with wooden support so the guns could fire through the wall and not over the wall. And the guns would roll back and forth on wooden platforms. There was no back on the fort wall. It was just that straight line. They were counting on the guns from Fort Nelson across the river. And Fort Nelson is where the Naval Hospital is today, and the point of land that was just below that. So the guns at Fort Nelson were supposed to protect the backside of Fort Norfolk. The reason Fort Norfolk was put where it is, if you look at the river today and realize that in 1794, all the sailing ships had guns on each side of the ship, and no guns on the front of the ship. And when they came around the river, they had to sail almost directly at Fort Norfolk for a considerable amount of time, meaning that our guns could reach out and touch them, but they couldn't fire back at us for a considerable amount of time. If they do manage to get past Fort Norfolk, then they have to deal with the guns of Fort Nelson. Also, the river at that point is even narrower. So... Fort Nelson gets a better aim at them once again. So this series of two forts was really a very good protection system for Norfolk. And so because the fort was made of earth and wood, they didn't maintain the fort really well because the country, once again, didn't have a lot of money. And that's why they decommissioned Fort Norfolk in 1802 because it had fallen into such disrepair and they decided only to rebuild Fort Nelson and make it stronger. This was also during Thomas Jefferson's administration and they were really cutting back on the size of the army and how much it was costing to man these coastal defense forts. Fort Norfolk is a rare jewel for people that really enjoy military history because most of the forts that were built as second series forts, and I should probably explain what a second series fort is, there are actually three series of forts in the United States. The first series forts were the original uh, coastal defense forts that I talked about that were built in 1794, 1795 which was the original Fort Norfolk. Then the second series forts were the forts that were built just before the War of 1812, and these are mostly masonry forts. Then the third series forts were forts that were built after the War of 1812 when the country realized we really needed better forts. And these are the forts such as Fort Monroe, 
Fort Polanski down south. These are much larger, have better gun positions. But a lot of second series forts were converted into third series forts, like Fort McHenry. You go to Fort McHenry today, and it is the actual fort from the War of 1812, but it has been modified uh, for better defenses later on. So you don't see what it looked like in 1812. Whereas at Fort Norfolk, except for the big naval magazine in the middle of the fort now that was built in the 1850s, the fort essentially looks the same as it did during the War of 1812. And that's really rare. So that's why Fort Norfolk is such a a national prize, that you can see a second series fort in this condition. Yeah, you've kind of made it a little bit of a personal mission right now and, and have traveled up to, to Washington, D.C. to see the National Archives and get all the, the documentation. I usually spend one vacation a year now in the National Archives, and I'll spend a week up there uh, digging through old documents, and then I bring them home and uh, type them out and put them up on my website and adjust the history of Fort Norfolk. And I've also located a large number of drawings of fort that are in the National Archives that are now on my website. And the Norfolk Historical Society uh, is also, you know, posting many of these pictures of of the fort. And because we paid for high digital scans of the fort, documents that are up at the National Archives, they are now available on the National Archives website. Because once you pay for a high-resolution scan of a document, the you not only get a copy of it, but the National Archives will put it on their website. So now anybody in the country can get these open-source documents straight off the National Archives website because we went up there, researched them, had them scan them, and now they're available to anyone in the country for free. What a great resource. Well, I want to thank you for coming out to, uh, to the district and taking part in, in Core Talk. Um, it's great, fascinating history about the fort. And uh, everything that, uh, that, that Steve was talking about, we are going to have uh, at least website stuff will be in the show notes. There's another resource that uh, probably about uh, a decade ago or so that the district uh, helped the um, Norfolk Historical Society create a little kind of mini documentary about a 23 minute video. I think it needs to be updated now. We found more information than what we had back then, but uh, uh, that is also available for viewing. And, and keep in mind that some of that information has been, uh, there's, there's more that has come out about the fort since that was produced. Right, no, Norfolk Historical Society is hoping to update a lot of the information in the, in the film and work with the Corps on updating uh, the information. Thank you so much again for coming out. So I had mentioned earlier in the episode that this month is Hispanic Heritage Month. And our Equal Employment Opportunity Office got in touch with us and gave us some pretty interesting facts uh, for our listeners. For example, this year's theme is Hispanics. Be proud of your past, embrace the future. Hispanic Heritage Month is observed from September 15th to October 15th each year. Uh, Beginning in 1968, Hispanic Heritage Month was originally observed as Hispanic Heritage Week under President Lyndon Johnson, but it was later extended to a month during President Ronald Reagan's term in 1988. The push to recognize the contributions of the Latino community has gained momentum throughout the 1960s when the civil rights movement was at its peak and there was a growing awareness of the U.S. multicultural identities. The observance is celebrated during this time frame due to many significant events for various Hispanic communities which fall within the observance period. September 15th was chosen as the starting point for the commemoration because it's the anniversary of the independence of five Hispanic countries, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Mexico, and Chile, 
who all declared independence in 1821. During this month, we pay tribute to and honor the contributions of Hispanic Americans whose proud traditions extend to Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America as their service to, to our country. Although used interchangeably, Hispanic and Latino have different meanings. Hispanic refers to anyone from Spain or Spanish-speaking parts of Latin America, but does not include Brazil. Now, Latino refers to anyone from Spanish-speaking and Portuguese-speaking parts of Latin America, but does not include Spain and Pol Portugal. Hispanic Americans are the largest minority in the United States today. The U.S. Hispanic population reached 60.6 .6 million in 2019, making up 18% of the U.S. population. Hispanic Americans embody the best of our American values, including commitment to faith, family, and country. Hispanic Americans also have demonstrated selfless service and sacrifices in the U.S. Armed Forces. As one of the fastest growing populations in America, Latinos make up more than 17% of the active duty military members who serve our country honorably. So for more information on this topic, remember to head down to the show notes for the link. All right, folks, so that's the end of season one, episode nine. I'd like to thank Patrick Bloodgood, Stephen Forrest, and Tanya Willis for their contributions to this episode. And as always, keep checking back each month on our Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all our social platforms, as well as our website for more information and more episodes of Core Talk. But until next time, this is Core Talk. Core Talk is the official podcast of the Northern District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Submitting emails or voicemails to Core Talk constitutes